Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part three of the section of the book titled Decomposition of an Operator. In this video, we focus on square roots of operators. Recall that an operator R is called a square root of an operator T if R squared is equal to T. Every complex number has a complex square root, so you might think that that would be true on complex vector spaces, but it's not. Here's an example. If we define t to be the operator on C3 shown here, then t does not have a square root. That's sort of intuitive because t is shifting over by one slot to the left, so the square root should be shifting over by half a slot, which makes no sense. However, that intuition is very far from a proof, so you should pause this video and prove to yourself that this operator t does not have a square root. Now that we know that not every operator has a square root, it's of interest to find conditions that guarantee a square root. Here's our first result in that direction. Notice that for this result, we do not require that our scalar field be the complex numbers. The result says the following. Suppose n is a nilpotent operator on our vector space v. Then the identity plus n has a square root. This result has an interesting proof, which we now turn to. Consider the Taylor series for the function square root of 1 plus x. Well, we don't actually need to know anything about this Taylor series. We don't need to know when it converges. And we don't need to know the coefficients, because this is just motivation. Because n is a nilpotent operator, n to some power m is equal to 0. In the Taylor series above, replace 1 with the identity operator, and replace x with our nilpotent operator n. That leads us to guess that the square root of the identity plus n is 1 plus some constant a1 times n plus another constant a2 times n squared, and so on. However, n to the nth power and all higher powers is 0, so what looks like an infinite series there is actually a finite series. All the terms after n to the nth power are 0. So we're just going to guess that there's a square root of the form shown in the last line here. We're not, again, using anything about Taylor series. At this stage, that's just a guess. Now, let's square the last line in the first column. Again, we're hoping that when we square that, we get the identity operator plus n. But we have to do some algebra, multiplying out the square. We get the square of that expression is the identity plus 2a1n plus the next term is 2a2 plus a1 squared times n squared. And then the coefficient of n cubed is 2a3 plus 2a1 a2, and so on, up until the last term is 2a to the m minus 1 plus terms involving the earlier coefficients times n to the m minus first power. And there aren't any higher powers when we do the uh, expansion of the square of that expression because n to the m and all higher powers is equal to 0. Now, we want this to equal the identity plus n, so I've written i plus n, and that's going to hold if certain conditions uh, hold for us. The first condition we see, looking at the coefficient of n in i plus n, which is 1, and the coefficient of n in red above, we see that we need 2a1 to equal 1. So we choose a1 to be a half. And then we need the coefficient of n squared, which is now in red above, to be 0. We've already chosen a1. It's a half, although that doesn't matter, the specific value, because we can now solve the equation 2a2 plus a1 squared equals 0 for a2. We get a2 equals 1 8. Okay, now we have a1 and a2, and we look at the coefficient of n cubed, which is now in red, and we see that we want 2a3 plus 2a1 a2 to be 0. With the choices we've already made for a1 and a2, you should verify that this forces us to choose a3 to be 1 16th. And so on. Continue in this fashion. At each step, solving for aj, so the coefficient of n to the j on the right side of the equation above is 0. And we can always do that because the expression always involves the coefficient a sub j plus lower order terms that we've already solved for. So in other words, there is a choice such that the expression in the last line of the first column, when squared, gives exactly 
i plus n. Conclusion, i plus n has a square root, completing the proof. Now we can use the result from the previous slide to prove the following very nice result. Suppose v is a complex vector space and t is an invertible operator on v. Then t has a square root. Before we get to the proof of this result, let me make a few comments. First, we cannot delete the hypothesis that the operator is invertible. We saw an example earlier of an operator on C3 that has no square root. Second, we cannot delete the hypothesis that the scalar field is the complex numbers because this is simply false if we work over the real numbers. In other words, there are invertible operators uh, on a finite dimensional real vector space that have no square root. Let's look at the proof of this result. Let lambda 1 up to lambda m be the distinct eigenvalues of t. For each j, there's a nilpotent operator n sub j defined on the generalized eigenspace corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda sub j, such that t restricted to that generalized eigenspace is lambda sub j times the identity plus the operator n sub j. The reason for this is that we had our decomposition theorem, and it said that t minus lambda sub j i restricted to that generalized eigenspace is a nilpotent operator. And then just doing simple algebra, we get the result shown here. Now, because t is invertible, that's our hypothesis, none of the lambda j's equals 0. So we can rewrite this by factoring out the lambda j, getting the equation shown in the last line. Now, a nilpotent operator divided by a scalar is still a nilpotent operator. So the operator i plus nj divided by lambda j is of the form i plus a nilpotent operator. The result from our previous slide says that this operator has a square root. Also, the complex number lambda j has a complex square root, because every complex number has a square root. This is where we're using the hypothesis that our scalar field is the complexes. So, multiply the square root of i plus nj divided by lambda j times the square root of lambda j. That gives us some operator, r sub j. That, by the last line in the first column of the slide, is the square root of t restricted to the generalized eigenspace. Now the idea for the rest of the proof is just put those operators r sub j together. Here's the specifics of that. The typical vector in V can be uniquely written in the form shown here, where each vector u sub j is a generalized eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda sub j. That's from our decomposition theorem. Using this decomposition, define an operator r by applying r sub j to each uh, vector in that sum in the appropriate way, as shown in this line. And then it's easy to verify that r is the square root of t. Please make sure you do the details, pause the video, and do the details to verify each step of this proof. It's a very cute proof. This concludes part three of the video on decomposition of an operator. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of Linear Algebra Done Right in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.